China is a developing giant to watch in an increasingly competitive and expanding global market. To determine China's extreme future readiness, we must examine issues beyond economics. Political procedures and cultural influences historically have impacted trends in education, environment, information, infrastructure, and the workforce. As China moves towards the extreme future at a dizzying speed, we'll discuss what the experts have to say about how well China has prepared for its version of the extreme future. Predicting future trends can be constructed by looking at historical and current information about education, environment, information, infrastructure, and the workforce in China. I'm Blake Rodebaugh. I'm Polly Johnston. I am Corey Indahl. I'm Jeff Dungan. I'm Amanda DiCardi. China Story Tonight on Extreme Future. Welcome to this evening's segment on high-speed transportation in China and where it appears to be headed. China currently operates over 56,000 miles of passenger rail connecting more than 2,300 cities. In 2010, this rail system carried 1,456,000,000 passengers. To put this in perspective, by comparison, the United States operates a passenger rail system of 21,000 miles connecting 500 cities and in 2010 transported 28.7 million passengers. By the year 2020, China is planning to expand its passenger rail system from its current size of 56,000 miles to over 75,000 miles. Within China's present passenger rail system, there are over 4,000 miles of high-speed rail with an average speed in excess of 120 miles per hour with an additional 10,000 miles of high-speed rail to be added by 2020. This, again, compared to the current single high-speed rail line, highlighted in red, in the United States between Boston and Washington, D.C., a total of 400 miles. China's investment in infrastructure, primarily in the area of transportation, in the years 1995 to 2010, totaled 1.8 trillion U.S. dollars. An additional $300 billion has been allocated for just high-speed rail for the years 2011 to 2020. Opening in June of this year is the 380 km per hour section linking Shanghai to Beijing. The 1,318 km trip from Shanghai to Beijing is expected to take less than four hours, comparing favorably to the two hours that it takes to travel by plane. We leave you with a final look at rail transportation in China today and into the future. with Dr. Johnston. She has been studying the trends in China's education at Fudan University in Shanghai for the past three years. Tonight, Dr. Johnston will give a brief description of the future of China's education. Dr. Johnston, you have the floor. Thank you. China has made great economic gains in the past decade and there has been much media attention around this. Not so well known, but just as impressive are the great strides that China has made in education 
in a relatively short period of time. They now have very ambitious plans for their future. It was very interesting for me to learn just how much China has done to improve their education system. China's accomplishments in education thus far have been that over the past 20 years, China has almost eliminated illiteracy among its 1.3 billion citizens. It's extended nine years of basic education across its expansive territories. It's developed elite high schools with world-class standards in math and science. And it's begun teaching English as a second language from third grade on and dramatically expanded the number of students in higher education from 1.4% of the age group in 1978 to 20% today. The strengths in China's education system, according to Asia Society, is that it has an extensive focus on math and science, an internationally oriented curriculum in high school, a coherent development process, and the systematic use of international benchmarking to modernize education policies. China also has a strong cultural commitment to education and its students are willing to study long hours. Asia Society says that China does face enormous challenges, especially the huge resource and achievement gap between rural and urban areas and a high stakes examination system that hampers innovation among its students. In addition, there is a need for Chinese education to move beyond simply knowledge acquisition to promoting the ability to think independently and apply comparative advantage. These are two traits in which American schools hold a comparative advantage. This advantage is what keeps America still at the top compared to the rest of the world. But will China quickly close the gap? Only time can answer this question. So what are the future plans of China? Well, by 2020, China hopes to make popular one-year preschool education and make popular two-year preschool education. In areas with mature conditions, China will make popular three-year preschool education. The plan will allow children in urban and poverty-stricken areas of China to be able to attend preschool. It will also allow, allow high school students of migrant workers to take the high school entrance exam in places where their parents work. This allows these children to have equal and fair education opportunities. Asia Society says that for much of the 20th century, the U.S. led the world in high school and higher education participation. Now other countries, including China, are making dramatic and fundamental reforms to prepare their students for success in a knowledge-intensive, high-tech, and globalized economy. There are many recommendations that the U.S. school system can implement in their schools to make them competitive with China. A few are make learning about China and other world regions a top priority throughout through their world history, geography, international economics, and through exchanges with schools around the world. Target the U.S. math science achievement gap and get more U.S. students to achieve in a truly world-class curriculum and these subjects. And lastly, expand Chinese language study so that 5% of high school students are studying the language by 2015. In conclusion, the Chinese government does have many ambitious plans for the future of its education and schools. It will have to overcome many challenges to meet the goals that have been set. Today, students will be working in a very global marketplace. It is imperative that all students, whether in the U.S., China, or any other country, are equipped with the knowledge, skills, and the perspectives that allow them to succeed in a highly global age and economy. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Johnston. Spielberg presents Back to the Future, a Robert Zemeckis film. 
Marty leads an ordinary life. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Well, history is going to change. And 1985 is not his year. But Dr. Brown is about to change all that. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? <laughs> Last week, the Chinese government decided to ban any and all fictional movies, shows, and programs because producers and writers are treating serious history in a frivolous way, which should by no means be encouraged anymore. This ban applies to fantasy, time travel, random compilations of mythical stories, bizarre plots, absurd technologies, even propagating feudal superstitions, fatalism and reincarnation, ambiguous moral lessons, and even a lack of positive thinking. This ban is the latest attempt by the Chinese government to crack down on subversive media content, like Terminator 2. One already cannot access YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and many other media and social networking websites. Like most communist countries, the Chinese Communist Party understands that in order to maintain social order, they must control access to information and reduce opportunities for their population to come together to organize any protest. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has given two speeches on Internet freedom, the most recent on February 15, 2011. Transcripts of this speech were reposted on Chinese blogs, only to be quickly taken away by the authorities. The United States Ambassador to the People's Republic of China, John Huntsman said, We are disappointed that some Chinese internet sites have decided to remove discussion of Secretary Clinton's internet freedom speech from their websites. It is ironic that the Chinese are blocking an online discussion about internet freedom. Part of China's plan to prepare for the extreme future is to limit the public's access to information. This is leading to an interesting paradox in China. As more and more of its population is able to access internet technology, the government is employing stricter and more elaborate systems to block information. This is making it increasingly harder for China to become competitive in the global marketplace. Google's withdrawal from China may be signaling a shift in the information technology business. Companies may soon become reluctant to do business with such a secretive and controlling government. This graph shows the explosion of Chinese internet users and web pages created by Chinese users. The most interesting information here is the number of Chinese blogs and user-created websites. It would appear that the Chinese population is aware of the media manipulation and is seeking to create their own content. There is already a special language used in many Chinese forums created to subvert government monitors and allow for open discussion of forbidden topics. Personally, I had to use a virtual private network to complete most of this project. While most people do not live in constant fear of government surveillance, it is definitely noticeable. In the last week, many of my colleagues' Gmail accounts were not working properly, and some had to change virtual private network settings as sensors are becoming more sophisticated. China's recent move to ban time travel proves that the government does not plan to abandon control of the media any time in the near future. The Communist Party is planning that their future rests on being able to control public opinion and information exchange while maintaining its standing as the world's second largest economy. It will be very interesting to see if these two ideals will clash and how it will affect China's preparation for the extreme future. Excellent adventure. Party on, dude. When you think of China, you might think about this. You might think of pastoral scenes such as this, or ones like this. You might see pictures or think about him, and you definitely think about 1.3 billion of them, and you probably think a little bit about this, definitely this, and a trip to China is not complete without seeing that. And nowadays we think of it as this, and definitely this and a lot more of this and therein lies the catch-22 for China. Britain, the United States and Japan have all gone through periods of enormously rapid industrial growth and many of them in the course of that have ended up leaving a legacy of pollution that they have subsequently needed to clean up. China has a different situation. It's going through an, an industrial revolution of its own, 
which in some ways is happening in a more compressed time frame than those other great powers in history. But it's also got pollution on a scale that those other great powers never quite experienced. So the question for China is how does the factory of the world, who wants all of this and this, but doesn't want to sell out completely, prevent becoming an environmental disaster on a scale unseen before in human history and still provide its citizens with a clean air and water and economic development. Economic growth is as close to China comes as having a state religion. One of the prices of the Deng Xiaoping era is that the party has in some ways really become fixated on economic growth. The whole authoritarian political system is geared toward producing not just high economic growth, but in some ways almost ever higher rates of economic growth. And what will China do when all of these guys want to race toward economic progress and enjoy the benefits of global economic prosperity? Recognize the more cars you have on the road, the worse the pollution will be. But we cannot free development. People should have cars, they shouldn't go back to the old days of the bicycles. It's simply not realistic. So to tackle the environmental problem, we need to set up some measures. We need to benefit both the environment and the people. The Chinese leadership is clearly focused on uh, the pollution problem and on trying to develop a more environmentally sensitive economic and political model. But don't expect changes overnight. Rampant corruption at the local level means we'll continue hearing about contaminated water and toxic spills. There's only so much even the central government can do when it comes to enforcement. But China is a country with plenty of ambition. And the thinking is, if it can apply the same effort to creating an environmentally sustainable future, then scenes like this will eventually brighten up to look like this. So as China looks to the future and develops into a world leader, it must protect its arable land and curb pollution of its air and water. China has the opportunity to become a world leader in alternative energy production and in so doing provide millions of jobs while preserving its distinctive culture. But if China wants to have this and this for future generations, it has to figure out how to fix this. Because if they don't, there is little hope on fixing bigger planetary issues like this. China has grown from a country closed to trade to a country thriving on exports because of an arts and crafts skilled workforce. But it hasn't always been this way. The havoc caused on the workforce after World War II changed when communist leaders put their focus on the development of a market-oriented economy. With the reforms came a higher standard of living and a greater output of production. Since the late 1970s, China has grown into the world's second largest economy due in large part to its arts and crafts workforce. The global economic downturn of 2008 impacted China greatly. The Chinese economic structure showed its vulnerability and long-term sustainability of the structure has come into question. Several manufacturing plants came close to idle during the global economic downturn as the demand for Chinese goods declined globally. China's arts and crafts skilled based workforce finds themselves with fewer job opportunities. China has relied on its workforce to produce goods cheaper and more efficiently than any other place in the world. And trends show that employment is shifting even more so away from agricultural and mining into manufacturing and services. But now China's leaders are worrying about the country's one-child policy and its impact on the current and future workforce. The policy has begun to stem the tide of young workers ready to step forward into the nation's manufacturing and services sectors. According to Zhang Jiang, an economist at the Guanghua School of Management at Peking University, the supply of workers has dried up for China. 
By 2025, one-third of the Chinese citizens will be over the age of 60. But even now, of the 550 million strong industrial workforce, only 154 million of them are under 30. This is a problem for China, as many of the jobs rely on those youthful attributes to carry workers through the long hours and physical demands of the manufacturing sector. The shortage of workers is a big problem, especially for factories, as it affects production and China's ability to produce low-cost goods. But it could be positive in the long run, as it will shift China's economic structure away from labor-intensive industries to high-technology-oriented enterprises. The economic downturn may actually be an opportunity for China to re-examine the training of its workforce. China is starting to follow India's lead in placing itself as a contributor and competitor in the engineering and technology sectors. But in order for China to prepare and come out successful in the extreme future, they will have to meet certain conditions. China should continue to push beyond manufacturing and service sectors by training a high-skilled tech workforce. The world needs to view China as more than a place to manufacture cheap goods. China should ease the one-child policy to negate the impact of its aging workforce. And China should focus on the country's interior and not just the powerhouse cities in the eastern part of the country. Only then can China truly be prepared for its extreme future.